Good morning, everyone. We're so glad you're here. I'm going to officially welcome you to this session on unlocking resources for recovery, renewal, and resilience. This session is presented by the Center for Positive Organizations at the University of Michigan, Stephen M. Ross School of Business, and the Managerial and Organizational Cognition Division of the Academy of Management. Nearly 20 years ago, the Center for Positive Organizations pioneered a new field of inquiry, positive organizational scholarship, that sought to understand the characteristics, practices, and principles that create a thriving organization. CPO's goal is to provide a home and an impetus for scholarship and teaching. Over the years, they've developed engaging opportunities to spark debate, compel action, and inspire further research. MOC is a specialized division within the broader Academy of Management that prides itself in being a bridging division, creating opportunities for people to engage across a variety of academic topics. CPO and MOC are thrilled to have the opportunity to bring you this virtual panel session that's aimed at arming you with resources for recovery, renewal, and resilience as we look toward the second half of 2020. The session will be moderated by myself, Jane Dutton at the University of Michigan, and Brianna Kaza at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. Now, we need this session because 2020 has been an unprecedented, difficult time for humanity. It's been and continues to be a challenging time for people and for organizations. We sit with the horror and unrest from the brutal killings of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmed Arbery, and countless other black and brown persons in the US and around the world. We hear loud calls for racial justice and global human rights. We sit amidst the fear, death, panic, and sadness arising from the continuing devastation and isolation brought about by COVID-19, folding businesses limited job opportunities, precarious work, and technological disruptions mar the economic landscape. It's a tough time to be a leader, a manager, and an employee, anyone who's trying to help work organizations recover and renew and resile in the face of these major obstacles, wounds, and setbacks. Yet, at the same time, we believe it's also a time of possibility and grounded hope for recovery, renewal, and resilience for organizations and for the people within them. This glimmer of light for the future is no way diminishes the, in no way diminishes the pain and suffering we may be feeling now, but it's in these times of turmoil that it may be helpful and powerful to look toward actions that can unlock resources from within people, within relationships, and within teams, and within whole organizations. By resources, we mean conditions, states and qualities that are valuable and which enable and ele elevate and facilitate effective action. Now I know that definition is pretty academic, but it points to the power and the possibility of finding, releasing, activating and expanding human-based resources like hope, trust, commitment, optimism, creativity, courage and energy, just to name a few. Part of the power of the focus on unlocking resources within people and social groups is that it's not an approach toward change that focuses on the need for material or financial resources. Rather, it locates the levers for renewal, resilience, and recovery in humans and in their actions. It focuses on the power of seeking and unleashing human resourcefulness at this time. We invite you to listen and lean into our six fabulous panelists who will help us to explore the research and practice landscape that becomes visible if we focus on unlocking resources in new, more deliberate and expansive ways. Now I'm gonna give a very abbreviated introduction of our wonderful panelists. Today, we have Madupe, Madupe Akinola, who's an associate professor of management at Columbia University. We also have Barb Fredrickson, who is the Keenan Distinguished Professor of Psychology and Neuroscience at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. We have Scott Sonnenschein, who's the Henry Gardner Simmons Professor of Management at Rice University. Jason Wilburn, who is the President of Forrester Instruments. 
Lynn Perry Wooten, who is the president of Simmons University, and finally, Monica Warline, who's the founder and CEO of Enliven Work and a core faculty member, member at the Center for Positive Organizations at the University of Michigan. Now, just again, as part of our prepping, let me give you some logistics for the session. During today's event, attendees are view-only participants and cannot be seen or heard. Questions can be asked using the Q&A feature. Please ask questions. We hope to address as many questions as possible at the end of the session. Questions will be visible only to the panelists and the moderators, not to the other attendees. Additionally, the chat feature has been disabled for all attendees. Given our past experience with these sessions, we found that these procedures promote the best learning experience for our attendees in this virtual format. And lastly, we are recording this event and will post the video on the CPO website later today and share the link via email with all attendees. The session flow, let me just give you a sense of how we're gonna do this. We're going to, each panelist will begin with three minutes giving their opening thoughts on unlocking resources for recovery, renewal, and resilience. Following that, we will have structured, we will have structured uh, the, the panel into three mini dialogues the first will be, how can people and organizations unlock resources? Where can we find these resources? And what can we do to forge a path toward recovery, renewal, and resilience? We'll then use any remaining time to pose outstanding questions to our panelists based on the questions submitted today from the audience. So let's begin. How has the current crisis touched you personally what are you seeing as glimmers of light? Is there anything that suggests the possibility of unlocking human-based resources, such as hope, trust, commitment, courage, curiosity, and energy, or any other resource that you see as critical in these trying times? Now, just to shake things up, we're gonna go in reverse alphabetical surname order. So we'll begin with Monica, then go to Lynn, Jason, Scott, Barb, and Madupe. So let's begin. Monica, start us off. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Brianna. Thank you to all of the work at the Center for Positive Organizations and the hosts at MOC for inviting us to this conversation. I appreciate so much being a part of this panel, and I am excited to hear what my fellow panelists have to say. <laughs> so I really was affected by the lockdown, shelter in place, uh, shelter at home orders that happen in the United States in a couple of ways. I had a trip around the globe planned to work, teach, share positive organizational scholarship and things that I talk about that would have begun in April. And as I was answering questions from universities and clients about whether I would continue to go on that trip, I made clear that I would travel as long as the US State Department didn't put a travel advisory in place because I thought that was a fair decision rule. And what I noticed that I want to share with the panel today is that it was the corporations first and then the universities and then the smaller organizations that I was working with that reorganized the way they were working, reorganized the way they were doing training and teaching and um, development events. And it was not the government that put a travel advisory in place that changed my plans. And that's the place where I feel that I've seen the most interesting glimmer of hope and space of resources unlocked for resilience. I've seen a tremendous amount of curiosity and creativity on the part of fellow teachers, on the part of fellow consultants and coaches and people who are interfacing with organizations to try to bring these ideas to life. And there's 
a new openness in some ways to finding human connection through technology, which we have always needed to do, and which was a hugely important piece of work before the social unrest and before the pandemic and before the work from home orders and the remote work essential um, work divide emerged. And now that those things have become a staple of our lives, I feel like more than ever, we can see that we really live in an organizational world and that we have to turn to and help these organizations meet this moment because they're the places and sources of creativity and hope, much less so, at least in my experience, than larger um, governing bodies. Thank you, Monica. Thanks, Monica, for um, your words of wisdom. You were so spot on when you said it was corporations and then universities. My own research looks at crisis smoldering sudden. And I remember at the beginning of this spring semester, we were starting to tell students they could not study abroad because of the things going on in the pandemic. But I never thought it was gonna hit the United States. And then reality came to me in the middle of March when um, my former employer, Cornell University shut down. Um, we sent students home. My daughter was home for spring break and she could not go back to boarding school. My son, who was at Michigan's law school, was texting me about when is the university going to close. And I realized that the world was about to change. And what hit me about this world changing personally are three quotes or three sayings that I've been walking around saying. One is, it takes a village. And I'm going to talk about why that's so important. The other is, keep hope alive. And I think hope is a theme that we're going to hear a lot today about. And the third one relates to Monica's comment about this moment. I keep on saying 2020 is a year for the history books that we'll never forget. So personally for me, it was already gonna be a year that I didn't, could not forget. I was leaving my Dean job at Cornell to become the ninth president of Simmons University and the first African-American president. But on the personal side, we had a wonderful family vacation plan that we hadn't done in years. And I had two children who were graduating one from high school and one from law school. So we had tons of events planned. I was gonna be traveling nine stops. I was gonna be Delta Diamond Plus because I had so much planned for the last few months of this term. But what the pandemic has really done and taught me one is to make the most of moments. And moments can be wherever you are, the place you live, um, and they can be virtually. It's also demonstrated to me how communities can be creative and how to create communities. Some of the most in, impactful moments I have had during this pandemic have just been being in community, whether it be um, Zoom meetings with my girlfriend, family reunions on Zoom, birthday parties. My daughter's boarding school did an extraordinary senior weekend of everything from a graduation to an African-American, affinity group to a chapel. They did just a wonderful thing about bringing people together for community. So that's what I've learned. Um, the other thing that's been big to me is this notion of the pandemic has given us hope because it's made us resourceful. People, organizations, and teams have had to reinvent themselves. On the personal side, even myself, um, some of you know that I wanted to be a home economics major. I never thought I would be a business school professor or dean. Well, I've gone back to sewing, I've gone back to freezing food, cooking, I've, you know, making my own cleaning products. I've learned, you know, I've done creative things. Um, my daughter made masks. And so this resourcefulness has really taught us a lot to help to be resilient. So um, kind of my departing thoughts are, yes, it is a year for the history book, but it's also something that we will remember. And if we have this growth mindset, we're all going to thrive and be better after this phase is over. Thanks. Thank you, Lynn. Jason. Yeah, thank you, Lynn. Uh, thanks, everybody, for having me on. Um, as we mentioned, I, my perspective may be a little different as a practitioner and not an academic. Um, that really, though, something that I, I want to point out, at least personally and organizationally, you know, we are dealing with two sort of major crises on top of all of our day-to-day -day and personal issues that we're dealing with. And, and I like to at least separate them in my mind, even though I know 
there's a lot of interplay between the pandemic and the you know sort of the heightened awareness of the social injustice in the world right now. But I just wanted to say one thing about the COVID and our response, both personally, um, me, my family, and our organization, and the Forest Third, is it it's an external threat. And, and I think you know it took us a little while to figure out, at least initially, you know, how to respond. And, and I have to admit, in February, I, I was very much with Monica. If whatever the State Department tells me is fine. Um, I traveled so much in 2019 that I actually slept in hotel room beds more than I slept in my own bed. And 2020 was starting the same way. And I was just like, yeah, well, you know, until the State Department tells me to stop, I'm not going to stop. And, you know, I'm very disappointed. I had a big South American trip planned for the end of March. And March 13th, um, you know, my, my son's the, the school, my boy's school basically said, don't come back Monday. And so we said, okay, everything stops. But the school's saying this, the CDC wasn't saying it, the State Department wasn't saying it, nobody was saying it. Um, you know, it was the, actually the, the local school district. And we said, okay. And we're a global organization and I had been talking to my peers around the world and it was pretty clear that this was a big deal and it was coming to the United States and it was already here by then, whether we were aware of it or not. But it was an external threat. And I think as an organization, you know, we didn't take it seriously enough. And then we overreacted a little bit for a couple of days. But then we got in our groove, we, we understood what the situation was, it took us a little while, we had a process, you know, we put our restrictions and everything into place. And so I, quite frankly, you know, it's been difficult, but it's been engaging and energizing because it's something that, although it's unprecedented, it's understandable and it's addressable and it's something that we can do. And a glimmer of light is we're adaptable, we, we react. You know, it's, it's sort of a well-defined threat like the virus, you know, it, you know, I have to admit in March, in, uh, in April, you know, I was, I'm sure I was speaking much more about the ambiguity of it all. But then you start looking at, you know, where we are. You know, I'm, I'm very lucky from a family standpoint. You know, we're very lucky. Um, but then you, you get into what I think is, is to me, more, more of an issue, and that's the, the social justice issue. Um, it's, it's external and internal. I mean, it's individuals, it's relationships, it's organizations, it's systemic. It's deeper and broader than a virus, which, you know, I know right now there are some really, really smart scientists sitting in a lab somewhere working on a vaccine that maybe it's six months, maybe it's six years, it's going to end and it's going to stop. And I don't necessarily have to do much other than, you know, work from home and do some Zoom things. And, you know, there's that, that sort of piece of it. So for me, the, the one that sort of grates at my stomach or sort of causes me a lot of issues it is more of the social justice side of it. And I, I take personal responsibility as a, as a business person for over the last couple of decades, we've been patting ourselves on the back. You know, we've been saying, look, we don't discriminate. We don't care about your background, your skin color, your sexual orientation, et cetera, et cetera. You know, as long as, as long as you can do the job, you can join our company. As long as you're a good company, I'll be your friend. You know, I don't, I don't think about it that way. And frankly, that's just not good enough right? It it's obviously hasn't gotten it done. And so I think from an individual and organizational standpoint, while the pandemic requires us to respond, it doesn't actually require us to change anything in turn, right? Our worldview, our approach, and what we're doing. And I, I think, and that's something that um, you know, I, I deal with quite a lot. And I'm, I'm actually hoping today to, to work on that and figure some things out and, and maybe learn from some of you on what we need to do, um, you know, spending the time to get to know people, to really embrace them, their stories, their struggles. That, that's where I'm struggling. Now, the glimmer of light, I don't know about the rest of you, but I, I look in the streets and it's amazing the people that are there, the new people, the different people. Um, you know, it, it's just that to me it is, you know, this is different. And I think it's different. And hopefully the academics who study this can verify that. I don't know, it feels different. Um, I'm not a protester by nature, but I did go to the vigils. I was a protester um, in my teen years against apartheid, and even the crowds then were pretty demographically similar. And what I see now in the streets is encouraging and amazing. I just hope we can actually take it and run with it and do something with it, um, especially you know where I have some influence in the business community, in my home, in my family. So that, that's what I'm optimistic about humanity overall and our opportunity that is presented to us that we can take advantage of. Thank you, Jason Scott.
Well, uh, thank you everyone for, uh, for having me here and I um, do look forward to hearing what everyone has to say. I think one of the things that we're, we're seeing early in our opening remarks is that you know, everyone has been impacted in, in some ways more, more than others by this uh, pandemic. And there's a lot of suffering out there in the world right now, which means there's also a lot of opportunity for us uh, to think about and uh, unlock our resourcefulness to help us uh, get through this. And certainly I was not immune to some of this suffering. I was uh, teaching at the uh, end of March, all of my classes got moved online. Uh, my mother was in the hospital for for 10 days in the middle of my teaching. And then in the middle of class, I got a phone call that my father was in the hospital. Uh, fortunately, they, uh, they are both doing fine right now, but that was a very uh, difficult time. Uh, a week later, I was set to launch a book that I had spent three years uh, uh, working on. And, uh, you know, as the pandemic is beginning to unwind, um, we're getting a lot of our media placements uh, from the major networks and from NPR basically pulled because not only uh, you know is the pandemic leaving the news, but our book, which was on joy at work, uh, tens and tens of millions of people were losing their jobs and no one wanted to talk about uh, joy at work, which uh, I understand from the grand scheme of things. But again, it also underscores another important point, which is these are some of the resources that we need the most at the times that we're facing right now and how we can unlock uh, joy and hope and courage and resilience are some of the things that I think are gonna help us get by in these difficult circumstances. So uh, first of all, I, I don't recommend uh, launching a book in the middle of a, a global pandemic. Um, but what I have done uh, since then was really uh, turn to uh, looking uh, for inspiration in how other people are doing their work for that source of, of hope and optimism. So I've been studying um, since the pandemic started how people in a variety of professions are uh, getting by and coping and being resourceful uh, in the pandemic. And I want to just quickly countries that I have found to be the biggest wellspring of hope and inspiration, and that's the performing arts. And if you think about an industry that has been decimated more than others, it's it's probably hard to find one as severe as the performing arts. Uh, there. Um, uh, theaters have been shut down. Uh, it's very hard to uh, practice um, in a socially distanced way, as one informant uh, told me. This is uh, one, uh, one profession where it's actually okay to kiss your colleagues, depending on the script. How do we socially distance a play like that? So they are facing massive challenges, but I'm really encouraged by just the source of, of hope uh, and optimism that they have to try and make things work from how they rethink what does it mean to have an audience? What does it even mean to have a play? What are the different parts that we actually need and are they always needed? How can we rethink every, everything that we do? So I found a lot of, a lot of inspiration in, in how they've been able to uh, not just get by, but think about thriving at a time when, uh, quite frankly, a lot of people are losing their jobs uh, in the theater but they're still optimistic that things will turn around and they're finding a way uh, for the show uh, to go on. And then I would just add that uh, at a personal level, um, I've taken a lot of hope and inspiration uh, from my children. Um, interestingly enough, children are naturally born resourceful and it's institutions like education and work that tends to quash out that uh, resourcefulness. And I've been amazed at what they've been able to do. So as they're you know, stuck home with homeschooling, they can't see their friends, they can't where um, it's getting very hot in Houston, there's not much for them to do as they can go in really outside their home. Uh, they've decided to uh, take on a new project that has taught them a lot and has uh, made life much more joyful for all of that. And what they've been doing is every week they research a new country um, and then they go and open a restaurant quality um, uh, venue for my wife and I, and they will uh, plan the whole menu. They will buy the groceries uh, online, uh, teach high management and entertains them during these times when it doesn't seem like anything else can entertain them besides a screen. They've learned to cook. They present us with this high quality meal. And at the end of the day, I don't get a bill. I get a big hug. And that's put a big smile on my face. <laughs> Thank you, Scott. Barb? Yeah. Um, well, I resonate a lot with what others have said. Um, Scott, my book, Positivity, came out like right with the 2008 crash. So um, kind of feel for you there. And like others, I, um, I had a really busy travel schedule for the spring. 
but not just the usual work travel. I had um, uh, my very first trip to Asia was going to go with my college age son. It was for mid-March. Obviously, that didn't happen. And then was going to do the college tour spring break trip with my other son. So there were lots of, um, you know, it's hard to let go of some of that, you know, stuff we were savoring in advance. And um, as a lot of you know, I study emotions and, you know, 2020 has given us so many emotions to deal with um, all at once combined, a, a lot of negative ones, um, anxiety, fear, a lot of anger, um, grief, sadness. And, uh, but my specialty is positive emotions. And, you know, sometimes it, in these really difficult times, um, there's a temptation to think that we should just set aside the positive emotions until we, until it seems more appropriate. Um, and, but my research and my own lived experience kind of slowly has gotten, um, made it very clear to me that those positive emotions, we can cultivate ones that fit the context, that are authentic. We don't have to be reaching for positive emotions by putting our heads in the sand or papering over some negativity with us, yellow smiley faces. Um, the, those positive emotions are breathers. They're really important um, resources for resilience. And I think what's really different about 2020 is that normally we tend to suffer individually and um, kind of in a hidden way. And in 2020, we're suffering in synchrony. We're um, not in all suffering the same way, um, but it's suffering nonetheless in that um, the, the pain and the worry and the troublemaking decisions, it's, um, it's very visible. It's very um, undeniable. And with that, I mean, people, of course, again, are at their own particular set of vulnerabilities or their own particular reckonings and opportunities to, to address change uh, facing them. But with that, um, with suffering so up front and center, I feel like the glimmer of hope is, is that it makes people realize that um, we need to take care of ourselves better. Um, it makes the press for self-care really strong as well. And especially because the kind of suffering we're dealt with this year is the slow suffering. This is not like a quick car crash that puts you in the hospital and you got to, you know, you can count on the human body just to mend. This is, um, as uh, Jason was saying, it's a, it's a long process that's going to get us to racial justice. It's a long process that's going to get us towards you know, getting back to any normal face-to-face -face interaction. And so we need to be ready to um, help ourselves and the people that we work with um, stay strong, stay resilient, stay resourceful because it's a long haul. So the glimmer of hope I see is that um, uh, it makes more urgent the need for hope my very favorite scientific definition of hope comes from the late Richard Lazarus, a really um, uh, pioneer affective scientist. He wrote, hope is fearing the worst and yearning for better. And it's in that yearning for better that we, I think, unleash, un unleash our resourcefulness, our ingenuity about, okay, we want it to be better. We yearn for it to be better. How are we going to get there? And that's where I think the inventiveness uh, comes in. So, uh, and hope is also the one positive emotion that so clearly um, is fitting and emerges when we're facing difficulty. It does. It, it actually is completely unnecessary when we're in good times. You know, hope is what we need in times like this. So. Thanks, Mabar. And Madupe. Well, I have to say that Barb set up everything that I wanted to say in such a beautiful way, as did so many of you with your remarks. I am on sabbatical. So when we talk about 
travel and travel plans changing and everything. Uh, that has happened a lot to me in this year. I had 14 countries on my list to visit, to work with collaborators, and believe it or not, I got through 10 of those 14 countries. And the last country that was on my list to spend three months at was Singapore, which is where I am now. And I couldn't have asked for a better place to experience COVID. What this experience has taught me is um, to live my research. I study stress and performance. I look at how people psychologically and physiologically react to stress and how it affects outcomes like decision-making and negotiation and creativity. And so I've had to step back and really say, wait, what do I say to other people? What do I try to teach myself? And how can I really live it? And I'm happy Barb mentioned uh, Lazarus and Folkman. You know, earlier Jane mentioned uh, resources. And I want to just talk a little bit technically to this allow us to think through how we're really making it through. Um, because I want to share how this experience has taught me about the resources I have to bring to the table. And so when I think about stress, I think some of the easiest definition for me is when the demands of the situation exceed my resources to cope. And what do I mean by demands? And what are sometimes things that people think of as demands? Well, situation is dangerous. Um, deaths from COVID-19, that's dangerous. Rioting due to the need for systemic racism to be um, ab ab abolished, that's danger. Uncertainty, I'm teaching in a month and I still don't know what it's really gonna look like. Effort, I mean the emotion regulation it takes, being productive, all of these are demands. But how do we combat that? Well, with our resources, which are knowledge and our abilities, with our dispositions, with our external support that we have to help us through. And so what I've been focusing a lot on are what are the resources that I can bring to the table? And one of the things I learned about myself, even though I knew this, was that one of my greatest resources is um, the dispositional trait of introversion. Some of you are like, are you, an, are you saying you're an introvert, would you And Those of you who know me, you might be like, no way, you're not an introvert. I am absolutely an introvert. I generate energy being by myself. And so for me, COVID has been a gift. I love the time that I've had to be solo, to not have to be as social, to just sit down and be present. Now, the other thing is that there's external support, as I mentioned, as a resource. And I have been absolutely overwhelmed by request while I'm, I'm on sabbatical to help out with, oh yeah, how do you undo systemic racism as a diversity scholar? So not just my own institution, but other people wanting my time, wanting my energy, but I'm really trying to focus and be on sabbatical. And so the external support I have, I have a writing and life coach who I can talk to about managing my time. I have a no club, two of my favorite people and collaborators who when things come my way and I'm not sure whether I should do them, I email them and I say, should this be a yes or no? I have an accountability partner every week. We email each other, what are you doing? What's your plan? What's by each day? And how did your past week go? So that helps me in having the external support to overcome being overwhelmed. And then finally, the last resource for me has been being able to take advantage of my meditation practice and running and exercise. I need to silence my mind. We all need time to silence our mind. And so doing so and focusing and taking the time um, that I've needed has emotionally given me the insight into what I need. And it's taught me to really lean on myself and give myself what I need instead of depending depending on others who are resources depleted to give me what I need. And it's been better to exercise, clear my mind um, to the extent that I can, because if I don't do that, then I'll watch bad TV, eat potato chips, pizza, and junk food. And so these resources have helped me avoid um, what people are referring to as COVID-19. That would be the 19 extra pounds that we all tend to gain in situations like this. So taken together, this has been an opportunity to find myself again and give myself what I need, but it's, I've had to force myself to do that. And in that way, I've had to live my own research. Thank you, Madupe, and all of our panelists for helping us today to start to seed our conversation on resourcefulness, renewal, and recovery. 
Um, I'd like to now move us into our first dialogue with Barb, Scott, and Madupe. And we're hoping that each of you can tap into what your research tells us about the possibility and means for unlocking resources right now in people and organizations. So to start, Barb, I was hoping that you could tell us about what you think the most important human-based resources are to unlock right now. And I know you helped us a little bit by giving us a preview of your views on hope. Um, and also what gives you the confidence that it's actually possible to have renewal, recovery, and resilience at this time? Yeah, um, great question. I think, um, you know, we're facing so many interrelated problems right now that it's really hard sometimes to get your head around them. And so one of the most important features of positive emotions that make them worthwhile to cultivate is that they fundamentally change the way the human brain works we are able to take in more information when we feel hopeful or when we feel um, uh, uh, safe and connected to others. We're able to um, not just see the glasses half full, but see the big picture. Um, the neuroscience, behave, eye tracking, behavioral studies all, all um, show this. It's a subtle effect, it's a temporary effect, but if we ever needed the chance to be able to see the big picture, we need that. We need that now. And, um, you know, thankfully, uh, positive emotions are shaped by the discerning chisel of, of uh, natural selection to bring us into these moments of broader awareness um, and uh, in ways that are, are supportive of resilience and, and building um, resourcefulness, resilience, um, social connections, and so on. You know, the, um, the other thing that I've been thinking a lot about recently is our, the importance of our uh, ability to collaborate and co-experience positive emotions. I, early in my career, I used to think that all positive emotions broaden and build in similar ways. Um, at least the ones that we had studied. More recently, I feel like um, the emotion of love, which I define as um, co-experiencing positive emotion, has even bigger effects on our broaden and build and upward spiral trajectories. So especially as we're dealing with less face-to-face, um, -face, uh, we really need to not have that be uh, too much of an impediment to uh, having uh, really meaningful times to connect and share um, positive experiences with one another. And, you know, sometimes that's going to be uh, in person, mask to mask. Other times that's going to be in these kind of forums where, you know, maybe it is more beneficial that we can see each other's whole faces. And so there are trade-offs between getting the whole face or getting the in-person uh, connection. So um, those are, uh, I guess, what gives me confidence that it's possible to unlock these, um, the resourcefulness, the big picture thinking is that emotions are our birthright. Um, it takes shifts in thinking or shifts in behavior to get there. Um, uh, we can um, change, uh, our, change up our activities like going for a run as, or meditating um, as Madupe was mentioning, or we could rethink about what is it that we're thankful for even in the midst of all this. So there's always a way to get there. There's always a situationally appropriate way to get to some positivity if you're still um, uh, able to be thinking about the next moment. You know, we're lucky to be here. That's one place to start. Thanks. Thanks so much, Barb. So Scott, you've been studying this phenomenon of resourcefulness for well, as long as I've known you for a long time. Um, I was wondering what you could tell us about your research and what it tells us on how challenging circumstances help humans to become more resourceful and why they do that. Well, in, in normal times, we, we think about and we use resources in, in typical ways. We, we retrieve from memory kind of that, that prototypical way that we, would, that we would use our resource, which means that during normal times, um, you know, we, we tend to um, end up um, 
coming around the way average, you know, the average way of, of using resources. So in, in many respects, challenges really allow us to expand possibilities. And, uh, you know, one reason for that is uh, for, we have a motivation, of course. Uh, there's a cliche that says, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. And, you know, what that really means is when our, when our backs are against the wall, we're really motivated to think about a better uh, or a different way of, of doing things. And that's where we can begin to unlock our uh, resourcefulness. Um, but there's other, other things going on too. Uh, when we're facing challenges, we almost give ourselves this, um, call it like a, a resourcefulness license, this sense that we give ourselves this permission to do things differently, to act in unconventional ways, which during normal times we have um, you know, counterintuitively, the constraint of trying to follow social norms and do things the way they've always been done. But it's during these challenging times that we have this permission slip to, to be a little unconventional. And where we're being unconventional, we're able to unlock new possibilities with what we already have. Challenges are also one of those moments where we kind of go through an almost like an existential crisis where we think about what our own identities are and our sense of self. And it's in trying to reconstitute, reconstruct what our sense of self is that we're able to begin to see ourselves, our strengths and our capabilities in ways that we might have missed. They might've been in front of us all along, but we might not have seen them. So as we recraft our identities, we're able to come out with a sense of a stronger self and a sense of a self that's able to do things in, in different ways and rely on different types of resources. Constraints also put boundaries on us. So it's, it's actually hard to be resourceful when you have a, a blank slate. So it, it's, it's a set of, of focus and driving our attentional resources to something that's a little narrower. And it's almost counterintuitively that by focusing on, on something narrower, we're able to actually expand a sense of, of possibilities. I think when we face challenges, there's also a sense of appreciation for what we already have. And when we appreciate and treasure what we already have, we're able to expand those possibilities as well. And then finally, I would say that there's a, a, a leadership perspective going on here uh, too. I remember when I was uh, studying a, um, a company during the, uh, the last major economic crisis, at least the, the great uh, recession of 2008 uh, that was thriving while so many of its other competitors were not only struggling, but many of them were going out of business. And what I learned from that uh, research and how this organization institutionalized resourcefulness was that, well, at, at first it, it almost just naturally happened because leaders were so focused with dealing with their own crises and challenges that they couldn't provide the typical types of resources, whether it be in the form of uh, knowledge resources or social support or mentorship. So employees were more or less left to be there by themselves. And it was that sense of not having what they expected that allowed employees to bring out their best and unlock resources they didn't realize they had. So kind of a, a lesson there is this idea that sometimes circumstances, even when they seem like they're difficult and troubling, and they certainly are in some pretty unexpected ways, also allow for others to unlock things they didn't even know existed. Thank you, Scott. Madupe, you spoke a little bit about your research on stress and mindset earlier. I was wondering if you could help us understand how resourcefulness is related to things like recovery, renewal, and resilience. And one of the things that Scott mentioned was expanding possibilities. Barb mentioned thinking more positively. And all of that is ultimately about shifting our mindsets about the situation we're facing. And I've done some work um, that has shown that when we shift our mindset from the idea that stress is debilitating to the idea that stress can be enhancing, that creates a unique resourcefulness that allows you to approach situations much more effectively and has positive outcomes. And so, you know, we've been told our dominant narrative is stress is bad, avoid it, reduce it, and counteract it. Um, how are you going to avoid stress when you're trying to teach your kid and be on a webinar and whatever, whatever, doing COVID? How, are you how can you reduce it and counteract it with healthy habits when you can't even go to the grocery store? I mean, 
this is, it's true, it's not a great thing, but it's really hard to practically apply some of these things in the current situation we're facing. So what the focus of a stress is enhancing mindset is to understand that yes, stress can be challenging, but we've all risen to the occasion under stress. And that in and of itself, that perspective can serve as a resource. What do I mean by that? Well, maybe we should just acknowledge that the stress exists. It is what it is. And that we can maybe find a way to welcome it. Okay, I've done decently under stressful time. Maybe it's something I can try to embrace. And then expanding possibilities, as Scott mentioned, is actually utilizing it and saying, wait, this exists because it's designed to facilitate. Part of the reason why our bodies were created the way they were or they are is so we can use the stressor to help us run away from the lion, run away from the zebra, whatever. And so some of my work has shown and collaborators' work has shown that when you shift people's mindsets to think about stress as enhancing, it increases their performance on both hard and soft skills. It decreases negative mood and anxiety. And also we found that it increases increases creativity, makes you sharper, more focused on positives versus negatives. And also, I mentioned that I study the physiology of stress. Their stress hormones, cortisol, which is one that we all have and we want to reduce to the extent that we can, but we found that when you have a stress is enhancing mindset, it allows for hormones that kind of counteract the negativity of cortisol to be in play. So dehydroepiandrosterone, never thought you'd know what that was, what did you? That is a hormone that you want to increase when your cortisol increases. And we found that when you shift your mindset, this beneficial, resilient mindset uh, hormone can actually increase your ability to actually meet the task at hand. So there are physiological things that are going on when we have perspectives that are resourceful, um, that allow us to be even better, to rise to the occasion, and to expand the possibility in front, possibilities ahead of us. Thank you so much, Madupe. So just to round out this conversation, I was hoping that you could each just give us one thing that we should be investing in right now, at this moment in time, to unlock our own and perhaps our colleagues or our spouses or children's um, resourcefulness. Madhuve, do you want to start? Sure. Um, so I teach our core required leadership course. And, you know, one of the things we always say is that the key to motivation is understanding that different people need different things at different times. And so I think similarly, the key to understanding how to get people to think about resourcefulness or be resourceful is to understand your people, to listen, to learn, to really take the time to maybe customize and cater things in a way that we couldn't before because now we need to. And we can't, there's no one size fits all solution. So listening and learning and adapting to the people around you, their needs, is really critical at this stage and how can we learn to do that a lot better? Thank you. And I just wanna underscore what Madupe was saying there in terms of taking the time to uh, sort of see what people's needs are. I think one of the, the most important things that we can do is create time, space, and safety for people to be able to reflect and accept what's going on in their lives. Um, accept it in the way of accepting it as an experience, not like accepting like this is going to be the way it is forever. But, um, and sometimes in organizational life, we need to be able to take the foot off the gas of achievement and outcomes in order to be able to do that. And to be able to recognize that to keep our, um, ourselves and our colleagues um, ready for the long haul, we'll need those, uh, we need to lean into that replenishment time, that self-care time, that time where we just listen to each other and what we're, uh, and learn what we are each you know, uniquely facing. Even this kind of shared positivity doesn't require that there's no negativity in the room. Um, we can share positivity as we're supporting somebody who's suffering um, because when, someone feels heard or understood when they're suffering, that's a little element of something that feels good to them. 
just in the midst of all the suffering. It's better to be recognized and seen when you suffer rather than be um, uh, bypassed and ignored. So, um, and when we're able to offer that to others, that um, the, the listening and the support and the, the letting people know we see you, um, we can feel good about making a positive contribution. So even when suffering and difficulty is the most obvious um, emotion in, in the space, there is room for that co-experienced positivity because it feels good to support and be supported in, in those ways that are um, where people don't make you feel like a, you're a burden just because you're having difficulties. So. And I would uh, echo, echo that point as well and realize that uh, when you have such a big exogenous shock to the system, it's also a moment to be able to uh, reset. And I think relationships are one of the, the biggest things that we can use as an opportunity to reset right now where it's you know, maybe more normative now to check in on people and ask how they're doing when before the pandemic, we would have never even thought about this. So this is a great time for mutual social support and to reach out to people and have proactive conversations uh, with them about uh, not just the work, uh, but how they're doing. I think we're seeing a lot more of that. I'm really encouraged by that. And I would also just add that in times like this, we tend to really want to exert a lot of control over our work because so much of work and life feels out of control. So I think another important point, especially uh, for leaders out there is to uh, just continue to have, have trust in the people that you work with and to recognize that uh, even though, you know, there's a lot that you, that you can't control, the answer isn't to try and control the things that you can, nam namely your employees. If you trust and empower them, uh, these are the folks who are often closest uh, to the front line and to the action who might have some of the best solutions to help uh, you and your organization uh, weather the storm. Thank you. Thank you so much, Madupe, Barb, and Scott for sharing your insights. I'd like to pass it back over to Jane um, as she welcomes the other half of our panel to our second dialogue. Uh, Jane, I think you're muted. So in this part of the dialogue, we're hoping to understand more about the, the means of unlocking resources and what your research and experience tells us. So Monica, let's begin with you. Based on your research and your leadership of Enliven Work, what are the most compelling examples of how organizations uh, today or in the past are unlocking resources from within? Thank you, Jane. I want to start out by giving an example that I think is really important and relevant for today. And it has to do with social movements. So I like to think about resources in action. And I've learned this from the thought leadership of Martha Feldman to talk less about resources and more about resourcing. And by turning the noun into a verb, it focuses on what we are doing. And to move toward any kind of a desired state, especially in the midst of difficulty, we have to understand what can we do with whatever we have at hand to move toward where we want to go. And the study of resourcing has really interesting roots in looking at small insurgent social movements that had almost no money and very little physical capital, but were able to accomplish social change in a much more effective manner than large social movement dedicated organizations that had a lot of money and had a lot of material wealth and um, physical capital. The question about why could a small band of really committed and passionate people accomplish social change when a large organization with 
a lot of money and a lot of political connections and um, buildings and lobbyists could not accomplish that change. And that is, I think, a resourcing question for today. And that research can tell us that part of what we have to look at is not uh, how much money do we have now, but what are we doing with the money we have? Right? And what else do we have on hand that we can put to use to move toward where we want to go? So we have right now a lot of anger in our society, a lot of justifiable anger that we could put to really good use if we thought about resourcing it toward making the kinds of social change that Jason was calling out when his introduction that Lynn is facing, I'm sure, as taking over the leadership of a large institution. If we borrow techniques from social movement organizations and import them into work organizations now, I think that's one of the most creative examples that I am seeing of turning the noun into a verb and resourcing new outcomes by elevating and making visible the anger and the dissatisfaction inside the organization as a resource toward moving toward a new desired state. And so um, one takeaway point, I guess I'm saying from this example of, I'm talking about the United Farm Workers in particular, but many social movements have demonstrated this same ability to make a lot of social change with relatively few quote unquote resources. And the turn toward action and the question, what can we do with we, what we have at hand, I think is an essential question. And thinking like social movement actors, whether we're sitting inside universities or we're sitting inside corporations or we're sitting inside small nonprofits, I think is very important now because we can, through communication, through compassion, and through making visible more of the anger and fear that exists, we can also ele elevate the pressure for responsiveness on these institutions. And one thing that I just want to make sure we do today, and I know we will, knowing Jane and Brianna, is that we don't only talk about the individual level. I think we're all you know, suffering in synchrony, as Barb said, um, and it becomes um, easier and easier for us to talk about what we are, can individually do, but we must also keep our eyes on the questions about what organizations can do, what structures can change, how can we reenact roles and routines that are right around us and that put pressure on other roles and other routines to change. Yes, thank you so much, Monica. I'm justing, just so I'm just got to say something about the light. I am definitely in the light. There was no light when we started, and my skylight is lighting me up in, in very bizarre ways. Um, anyway, Lynn, we'll turn to you. You've studied organizations and crises for decades, um, and you've led various organizations through tying times. How are you thinking about unlocking resources as you step into this important role? as president of Simmons University. Jane, as you know, um, Erica, James and I, Warden's incoming dean, we joke about that we've studied crisis as old as my son is, and my son is 25, and that's when we first started this research. So we say for a quarter of a century. But both of us, um, speaking to what Madupe said, in the last few months have had to live our research. And when you have to live your research, that is when the rubber hits the road about all the things that you've studied. And the way that we've been really approaching how do you unlock resources in times of crisis and even good times, and at the organizational level, what Monica said is, is that you have to be people-centric. You have to come together in community and think about what is going on in my world. And to borrow Carl White's um, nomenclature, sense-making of it. And so with my team, I've been spending a lot of time understanding what's going on in the world how do you sense make of the crisis situation? 
And once you sense make of the crisis situation, you're able to think about the resources you need now, the resources you can draw upon from the past, and the resources that will carry you forward to the future. The other important part of sense making is the ability to look inside and outside your organization. So with my teams, I've been spending a lot of time scenario planning, and that's the sense making of it as we decided what we're going to do for the fall, but also analyzing the resources inside and the partners, the people that we can adapt outside. A third important practice about unlocking resources and really should be the core of what you do are your guiding principles, your values, who you are, who you want to be as an organization. That should always kind of be your North Star or your compass. In addition, my research really supports the part of, um, as Bob Quinn would say, building the bridge that you walk on it, but as Erica and I say, learning in action. Crisis management entails communication, it entails action, as Monica said, but it also entails learning and reflection. And if you don't take time to learn from the crisis situation and to be better at it, then you're really wasting a crisis. An example of two industries where we see it in real time are education and healthcare. Um, one of my colleagues said that these two industries had to change. Basically, they thought it was a blizzard, but it's been an ice age change. Let's take education, which many of us are in. We've been talking about remote learning forever and getting online. All of a sudden, the pandemic comes, and now we had to get online within a week or two. And we realize there are good things about in-person learning, but there are also things that we do better online. So that's an opportunity. Likewise, seeing a crisis and an opportunity from learning is healthcare. How long have we been talking about electronic medical records and telemed? And now, um, you know, I, I gave the example that my, even my 85-year-old mother feels comfortable with telemed. So the healthcare industry is another example that has had to change and learn. The final thing um, that I want this panel to talk about and our audience to think about, and this speaks to all of the things we're seeing with anti-racism and social justice is, crisis is an opportunity to challenge and change the status quo. I think it's so interesting that we've seen the pandemic and we've seen the social justice, social reckoning movements come together. And my theory is, is that we've all had months now to think about how we want the world to be a better place and to develop opportunities to challenge the status quo. Thank you. Jason, you've worked to implement the principles of positive psychology and positive organizational scholarship with several organizations now. What are the ways that your current organization is working to cultivate resourcefulness for recovery renewal, renewal at, at this trying time? Sure. So one of the things that's interesting about this time and what we're faced with right now is you really have to work with what you have on hand. Um, obviously, we can't get together and figure out a path forward in a room. You know, we can't, you know, spend a bunch of money on training seminars or anything like that. So you need to start with what you have. And so the primary focus going into this was creating a sense of uh, psychological safety within the organization. Right? We wanted to make sure that every employee felt valuable and that they were part of the team and they were moving forward. So we went with the basics and you know, so we have in place ground rules and we have five ground rules. Um, you know, assume positive intent, be open with each other, trust and respect each other, be present, have fun. So we basically you know, had to revert to what we have and we, we focused on the ground rules. We focused on the ground rules in all of our meetings and all of our interactions, you know, assume positive intent. Just because you can't see somebody, you have to assume that they're trying to do a good job. They're doing the best they can. Are we doing everything we can to put them in a position to be successful? Um, be open with each other. You know, we, we need to acknowledge the individual and the organizational difficulties as directly as possible. Communicate clearly where we are financially. Ask for help. Um, and I appreciate you know, Mr. Wayne Baker and his articulating of, you know, the importance of asking for help and supporting the people across the board. Um, you know, be open. We also focused on trust and respecting each other. That was one of our ground rules. And, and so we did end up cutting you know, everybody's pay across the board in some hours. We needed to furlough some people when the work dried up. We communicated clearly though that the goal was to keep this team together and you know, come out of this intact. And I, I generally don't like referring to sports or, or using sports references and analogies as a crutch. 
but I lean very heavily on the, the late Bo, the late Bo Schembechler, the former head coach of Michigan football, and sort of his constant refrain, you know, anybody who knows anything about him and the way he managed his team, the team, the team, the team, the team, the team, and we just kept messaging. We still keep messaging. We love this team. Uh, we intend to stick together. It was well received even by our Buckeye fans in our Ohio office. If you sacrifice as a team, you can celebrate as a team. And so that it's just so much sweeter that way. Um, we're also very clear that it can't go on forever, um, but we are going to do everything we can to keep the team in place. And we have not permanently laid off anybody or eliminated any positions at this point in time. And we don't plan to, depending on how long this goes. Um, you also need to be in trust and respect, uh, empathetic and understanding, um, which is sometimes a personal weakness of mine, but I'm working on it. And just, you know, working from home is hard. And, and you know, no matter what the external you know, ramifications of the different things we're going through right now are, it's just important we understand that everyone is struggling in some way at some point. And we just need to be empathetic and understanding and support each other. And then, you know, we'd be present, another one of our um, ground rules. And we want people that want to be at Forrester. And the team wants to be here to be successful. You know, we need to make it's so that we are sort of individually actively engaged or take the time. I heard that earlier. You need to take the time. It's important. And you need to hold yourself. And I hold myself personally accountable. And quite frankly, I'm mindful of my interactions and how I invest my time with the employees and the people in the organization. And uh, as I was preparing for this today, I went back and looked at my calendar and I really haven't been doing a good enough job the last few weeks. So I need to revisit that. And our last one is just have fun. And we're still celebrating. We're still doing our shout outs and our spot bonuses. You know, we continue to celebrate and be thankful for whatever we can. And luckily we didn't have to completely shut down. So we're thankful for that. We were able to participate in the payroll production program. So we're thankful for that. Um, you know, although we've taken reductions in pay, you know, everybody's still on the team. We're thankful for that. And you know, basically I just have to admit also that I'm lucky that I work for a family owned business. And, you know, the, my bosses are all family members and they really do think long-term and they value people, which has made a lot of this easier. I ran over my time a little bit, but I apologize. <laughs> Thank you. Now we're going to turn to Brianna, who I think is going to execute a different kind of finale part. Hey. Thank you. Um, I'd like to invite all of our panelists back for one last lightning round where we are going to ask you to reflect on the ways in which we can use teaching and training to help workers and leaders of all kinds to see and act on the possibilities that you have raised for unlocking resources. Um, so I'd like each of you um, to just share out one tip that you might have that you can provide audience members with about ways they and their organizations could become more resourceful right now. So I'd like to start with you, Madupe. So I think one of the biggest tips is being able to perspective take, to share your truth, to share your story and your experience, and also to hear about other stories and experiences, because that's the only way we're all going to learn. And so in other words, we really need to teach people how to have difficult conversations across difference to unlock resources. And you know, even just being on this panel and in this session, I looked at the Q&A and there was one point where somebody said, um, yeah, this is great that you're all talking about the trips you missed, but people are dying from COVID. Thank you. That helped me to really take perspective, take a little bit more about how I speak what we talk about, how we talk about these things. So learning how to call people out when they need to be called out is critical. I right now spend most of my time thinking about how people and organizations can gain the resourcefulness to dismantle systematic racism. And some comes from asking the question, what am I fearful of? Can we all ask ourselves, what am I fearful of that's making me not want to disclose my diversity stats? What am I fearful of um, that makes me not want to change this system and process in a particular way? Because if we don't address that, we're not going to have the change we want to see. 
And finally, I have to personally say that I am absolutely exhausted by being the only Black person or one of very few in most environments I'm in. So I would like each of you to use your resources to be bold and brave and courageous to ensure that your organizations have more people who look like me and to ask yourself, what am I afraid of that's preventing me from doing that more? And to teach yourself how to actually answer that question. Thank you, Madupe. Barb? Well, I, just to underscore um, uh, Monica's point about how we can't be, just be thinking about taking care of ourselves, but about unlocking uh, structures and resources at the organizational level. I uh, just want to praise all the things that I've learned through um, the Compassion at Work book that Jane and, and Monica put together in terms of, you know, reminding us how to be human at work and not just work at work and um, use our skills and, and listening to what um, difficulties people have and then taking all of our resourcefulness within the roles that we have um, and bring bring resources to where they're needed most rather than turn away from um, uh, people's difficulty and suffering. And um, yeah, one interesting question came up about what about, you know, toxic positivity. This is actually one of the biggest ways I think positive psychology gets uh, abused or misused is people thinking that, you know, no, got to be positive nonstop. Um, positive emotions last for seconds. They shouldn't be like a mask or a uniform. And when they are, they are they do become toxic. So um, the key is to keep them situationally appropriate, authentic, brief. Um, uh, frequent is, is good, but um, we can't just put on positivity like it is a, a uniform or a bulletproof vest. Um, that's a really um, stark misunderstanding of what this kind of resource is about. So, thanks. Thank you, Barb. Scott? I think now is a good time to re-envision our communities of practice and to see what we can learn from people who we would you know, otherwise necessarily not be engaging and dialoguing with. Uh, so it's, you know, it's about kind of consulting an, an outsider and trying to understand uh, what, you know, someone who has a, a similar job or is in a different industry, what they might have to say about the problems uh, that we're facing and to generate new knowledge and to realize that as, you know, everyone is suffering in their own way, that a, a lot of our problems at the most abstract level are actually very similar. And so, you know, the real, you know, basic level, it's, you know, as we're getting ready to, to teach online in the fall, or many of us to teach online in the fall, what can we learn, for example, from late night talk show hosts like Trevor Noah, who are, you know, moving his show online, and he's sitting there staring at the little uh, green dot uh, at the camera, but still being able to interact and engage with it, with his audience. So these are these are types of resources that we otherwise necessarily would not have even thought about how they can inform our own work that I think are going to be really helpful in helping us rethink about what we need to do. Thank you, Scott. Jason? So from a tip standpoint, I'm not an academic or researcher. I can only tell you what I've done or what's worked for me. And, and I highly recommend for anybody who's just getting started in this is keep a gratitude journal, write down the three things that you're grateful for every day. Um, over time, make sure at least one of those is a high quality connection. And then also start looking for high energy people and documenting those as well. And then you'll start to see a trend and you start looking and reviewing and uh, reviewing all of the different things that you're grateful for in your organization. And, and by the way, if you don't get any gratitude journal entries that are based on your work, you should probably find something else to do. Um, but the, the patterns and trends and the threads are, are what you build on and it's how you build a resilient organization is you focus on those things that you know, you're grateful for in every organization, no matter how um, negative or distrustful or, or difficult things are, has a thread of positive energy running through it. There are positive people, there are good things and it's building on that. And your job as a leader is not to do all of the great work, it's to identify those people that are having a positive impact in your organization in your world, in your social movement, in the, anywhere, and, and help them, facilitate them, amplify them, and do everything you can to make those people successful. 
Thank you, Jason. Lynn? Lynn, I think you're still muted, sorry. Oh, it just muted again on you. Many of you have seen the African proverb, um, if you want to work fast, go alone. If you want to um, go far, you have to walk with other people. And so one of my tips is, is that spend time investing in your own personal development and learning, but also organizational learning. Have time to have learning labs, come together as communities to think about how you can advance learning, whether it be communities and your organizations, your educational institutions, or your nonprofit. My second big takeaway is um, I've made my whole life work on preparing the next generation to lead the world. And I hope that's the life work of all of us. This is an unprecedented time. And I'm hoping that people think about um, equipping this next generation with the skills to alleviate inequities, to get rid of all the isms that we've seen, and just be resourceful in making the world a better place. Thank you, Lynn. Monica? Thank you, Bree. I started off my study of organizations looking at semiconductor firms. And I've also studied agile developers and software. And I think right now my one tip is that no matter what kind of work you do, we should borrow from the best fabs and the best agile development teams, something they do every day. They have a 15 minute or 30 minute um, kind of meeting. They call them different things. But I am working really hard to have a reg regular short connection with everyone I work with as regularly as I can. And um, if you run a team or if you work with a group of people that you can call a team and put yourself into the mode of being a team, I have a structure that I've been talking with lots of teams about that seems to be helpful. Um, it's called Sync Up, Stand Up, Psych Up. Um, so we're informed by um, Barb's work a lot and trying to keep the the authentic positivity high on a regular basis. The sync up is Monday, let's get aligned and get our work organized. The stand up is Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, let's um, celebrate what we're doing and keep ourselves focused. And then the psych up is let's make sure on Friday we celebrate and recognize our wins before we call it a week. So that's something that no matter what kind of industry we're in. I think we need to be doing more regular touch bases now that have positivity, authentic positivity infused in them. Thank you, Monica. So we've had so many great questions come in from the audience. Um, and I just want to take the last seven minutes before we close this up to pose a couple of them to our panelists. Um, the first one I wanted to ask, um, as someone asked, how can leaders and educators elicit hope or other positive emotions in an authentic way right now in response to others suffering? So for example, what is the way that someone could best inject positivity or some of the other resources that we've talked about um, into an anti-racism conversation with somebody who you notice is suffering in this moment? Yeah, I think one of, if I can address that, I think one of the key ways to, um, uh, it, again, we've touched on this a lot, is listening and being present um, is one way that it's not about um, being jovial. It's just being quietly present and registering what people are going through. That is uh, a source of positivity right there. But also just recognizing how hard people are working um, in their own efforts to you know, uh, create more racial justice or other and realize that, you know, that's got to come with some exhaustion. And how can we make sure that you're ready for the long haul? What can I do to support you? I mean, this is just asking, asking people, um, or as Madupe was saying, how can I care, you know, we can say, as uh, non persons of color, what can I do to help carry the load? What can I move forward? Um, so that it doesn't all fall on you? Or, um, 
just what can I do to support you? So even just um, asking those questions, it doesn't sound like you're bringing in positivity, but you are. Great, thank you, Barb. And I think also recognizing that some conversations, there isn't an opportunity to inject positivity. And that's okay. Why do we feel so uncomfortable when we, we can't inject some positivity? So that again is checking yourself and saying, what am I fearful? What is this bringing up in me that I feel like I have to say something positive when right now, let me not. Let me just be still and just be present. And I think that requires an emptiness on your own part to be able to receive and also to be able to check yourself in those moments you need to check yourself. Thank you, Madhupe. Another question that we had come through has to do with um, issues around social movements. People resonated with what you said, Monica, about um, thinking of this as a social movement and becoming an activist. But at the same time, um, people acknowledged that some of us, uh, public health workers in particular, um, especially in government, have been silenced by higher ups um, and they've, they've had increased demands. Um, uh, and so what is it that you can provide for them in terms of supports and, and tips for the public health workforce, as well as many other who have been on the front line um, and are being called to be critical at this moment in time? Yes, I really oh. want to, oh, sorry, Scott. Did you no, want to? Go ahead, Monica, please. I, I want to acknowledge the reality of this that contained in this question, and I want it to be very clear that we're not ignoring the jeopardy that can come with speaking up. I think we've talked about hope as a resource, but we should talk about courage as a resource here as well. And it's also really important to understand that when, when I'm talking about how scholars have looked to social movements to import those practices into other kinds of organizations, and a very important part of any social movement is understanding the lay of the land, making sense, as Lynn said, of what's going on, and then finding the coalition of allies and people who are supportive, building that coalition, investing in those resources, and finding ways to take action together. So it's, um, it may, the, the, I find it one of the reasons that I started, and maybe I started us off on a difficult trajectory by starting with that I had personally been affected by my travel plans being canceled, was not because that was a source of suffering for me. It's because what it elevated for me is that when I look to organizations that are making responsible decisions and finding ways to be creative, that's when I can see hope. And when I look to the larger governing structures in, in the United States right now, it's when I have the hardest time seeing hope. Right? So we need ways to become social movement activists, no matter what role we hold, and build coalitions of people who want to move toward the same desired end, no matter where we sit, so that we can make more visible and um, make more heard the anger that does exist, right? The difficulties that do exist. The more that we bring public pressure to bear on not silencing public health officials, the more that we bring to bear that as a community, we want public health guidance and we want public health to be invested in in our country. Um, the more that we put pressure on governing bodies to respond. So I don't think we can go it alone here. I think we need allies and coalitions, and we also need the courage of our convictions and um, the voice of others resonating with us. And I think that also speaks to the fact that we can't just let anger as a source of change exist in communities of color. And someone very rightly called that out in our question and answer as well. We have to make visible, and I believe it's true, that there's anger across lots of communities now. We don't know how to band together and turn that into a resource for collective action. And I think that's what we have to do, no matter where we sit, we have to ask ourselves, how can we occupy that role of change agent now? Thank you, Monica. Scott, did you wanna 
add something to this question? Uh, I was going to say that one of the things that, that gives me hope is that um, business organizations have started to take uh, a much more proactive stance in addressing uh, social issues. So as you know, people we are beginning to lose confidence in government institutions. Um, you know, there's an interesting moral question to be asked about you know what role businesses should be playing in these types of conversations and what you know you know what mixed motives might be there. Uh, but one area of hope is to think about the power that we all have. Many of us are business school educators in not only helping uh, bring uh, these social issues to the forefront, but also equipping and training our students and the people that we work with in ways where they can be uh, successful change agents. And it's not a, a binary thing or it's, you know, you're, you're a, a, a social change in agent or you're not. There's, there's lots of steps that we can take with different levels of um, engagement, uh, depending on the type of organizational context that we're in and how we might be able to, in more subtle ways, uh, use language to help shape agendas and spark change uh, from inside organizations and then have that percolate up into our, our government institutions uh, if they're not working. And then there's things, you know, that give me hope too, where you look at what's happening in, in Florida, where you have a woman who is working in a public health organization and did not like the way this state was reporting um, results around the pandemic and she started her own website and in many respects is a more trusted source of information for people in that state than the official government institutions are. So you are beginning to see a lot more momentum uh, around uh, empowering people uh, through small actions and large actions to try and address some of the shortcomings uh, that are not being resolved by our government institutions. Thank you, Scott. And just our final question, um, we opened by talking about all of the different demands we're all facing. Uh, and someone asked, you've mentioned that crisis can be an avenue for hope and resilience, but how do you recommend dealing with the multiple overlapping crises um, when it seems like every day there's a new negative event or more news, which um, can pull our focus and make us even more depleted? I think Barb is just unmuting herself. Sorry. Um, I think one of the great uh, things to realize here again is it, when it becomes more and more obvious that we're dealing with so much, it becomes more and more obvious that we need to meet that with being really uh, focused and intentional about developing these resources of compassion, courage, resilience, hope. Um, uh, self-care. These are not um, resources that are uh, domain specific. They will help us across all of them. Now, sometimes we might need to say, well, today is the day I'm going to work on this problem. And maybe tomorrow I'll work on this other one um, to try to not have to um, sort of drink from the fire hose all at once. You need to know when to, to back off, but when it becomes so obvious how much we have to hold, it becomes also so obvious how much we need to um, uh, generate resources in ourselves and others and alliances um, and teams to address them. Thank you. I learned from Jane Dutton a phrase that I use all the time to answer that question, Brie, which is, <laughs> which is uh, apropos of today because she had to move out of the light. But um, Jane often said, go toward the light. Even if it's just a tiny glimmer, look for the tiny glimmer and go toward the light. And that's one mantra that I keep um, looking every day. Where is there a little glimmer of light? And let me go toward that. Monica, I also learned that from Jane. And I think it's important to remember when you go towards the light, you don't have to go alone. Sometimes we think we have to go alone, but take a deep breath, do the self-care that Madupe says, and then ask yourself, I'm going to walk in the light and who else can I bring in the light with me to help me get through this situation? Thank you, Lynn. Well, now I'd like to pass it over to Jane, um, who will take us into the light <laughs> to close off this session. Yeah, I just want to take uh, um, this opportunity to 
genuinely thank all the panelists who worked hard in preparing for this and sharing their wisdom with all of us. And for everyone who's on the call, um, I hope we'll continue the conversation and really the metaphor and the reality of the possibility of unlocking resources could not be more important than right today. So I hope you'll continue to engage this question and I hope that you'll continue to find um, glimmers of light. Uh, we also want to invite you to look forward. Um, we will have other panels, another one coming up on August 4th. Be sure to stay tuned for, for more information on that. And for now, all of us would wish to thank Thank you for attending, and um, we hope you'll find this session, but also the recording from this session, useful as we all work our way through this these times. So thank you.